Hi again, I'm Dave Kennett, W8KFJ. This is part two of my video, How to Get More Out of Your ELAD FDM Duo. If you haven't seen part one, I would suggest watching it first. It discussed operation of the duo in standalone mode. This is an introduction to the SW2 software, also used by the ELAD receivers, but with some minor differences. So if you have one of the receivers, this might be a good place to start. I'm recording this in March 2017, and since changes come so fast, it might not be up to date when you see it. First, install the software and drivers using the detailed instructions in Section 7 of the FDM Duo Manual. If you have one of the ELAD receivers, follow the instructions in the receiver manual. For this video, I'll be using my regular Shack computer, the Intel Mini NUC computer with an i5 processor. For now, I'll connect only one USB cable between the RX USB connector on the Duo and a USB port on the computer. Most of the software functions can be accomplished with just this one connection. It might be useful to have the radio and SW2 running while you're watching this, pausing the video to try something firsthand. The interaction of the software controls and the controls on the radio can be confusing. First, recognize that for receiving, the complete spectrum, 9 kilohertz to 54 megahertz, is digitized in the radio, and that data is processed completely in the radio for standalone operation. At the same time, data from the receiver is sent to your computer via the RX USB port for simultaneous processing by the SW2 software. So, if you listen to the radio, either the internal speaker or headphone out, then the adjustments on the radio affect what you hear. If you listen to your computer, then the software adjustments affect what you hear. As an example, the filter width, E2 on the radio, will affect what you hear listening to the radio, while any filter adjustments in the software will affect only what you hear while listening to your computer. Multiple software receivers may exist anywhere in the pan adapter, but the radio itself is always tuned to the center frequency. I repeat, the radio itself is always tuned to the center frequency. Some adjustments, like tuning and mode, are usually locked together and like many characteristics of this radio, may be tailored to your preferences. The transmit function is handled completely in the radio, so all transmit settings are through menus in the radio, even though you're running the software. Although it is possible to switch the transmit audio source from the microphone connector to the TX USB connector. This may be accomplished with menu 32, TX in, in the radio, or by using the software's transmit settings above the waterfall. For now, make sure menu 32 in the radio is set to mic. Once a USB cable is connected between your computer and the RX USB connector on the radio, power on the radio and ensure that it's working. Open the SW2 software. The main window should appear. If you get a small window with offline and connect to server options, the software cannot find the radio. Check your USB connection as well as software and driver installation. Once the main window opens, you'll notice that nothing much seems to be happening. That's because the radio needs to be turned on. Click on the power button in the extreme lower left corner of the SW2 window. It should turn green and the screen should come to life. In the upper right corner, you'll find the typical Windows controls to shrink SW2 to the taskbar, or to choose a full screen or adjustable window, or shut down SW2. Strangely, all SW2 windows can be sized only from the lower right corner. I like to size it so that all 16 of the band buttons show, but not the white memory block. I prefer to open a separate memory window when I need it, as this saves a little screen space. Let's take a quick tour. In the upper left hand corner you can mute or unmute all sound. To the right is an indication that the software has found the FDM Duo. It is also a button to open the standalone control panel. 
I counted over 20 various windows in SW2, and we'll talk about most of them before we're finished. Next, the S meter, with an indicator for DBM as well as S units. An icon that opens a user profile window allowing you to save, then recall up to eight complete settings, thus restoring the radio to an earlier configuration. Next, an ELAD logo that just looks pretty. A question mark that opens a window explaining keyboard shortcuts. Very useful, and most are easy to remember. Below that, a checkbox for attenuator and a 54 megahertz low-pass filter labeled LP54 megahertz. For normal operation, it should always be checked. The receive attenuator is 12 dB and normally can be left unchecked unless you suspect that an overload is taking place. There is no preamp. Occasional flashing of the A to D overload indicator is normal and does not indicate that the attenuator is necessary. People are surprised to find that nothing appears to happen when they check or uncheck the attenuator. This is because the spectrum display and the S meter compensate for the attenuation. Nobody's signal is really weaker just because you inserted the attenuator. That is, an S7 signal is an S7 signal regardless of the attenuator setting. It is unlikely that enabling the attenuator will hurt anything if you have a decent antenna connected. With no antenna connected, you'll see the noise floor rise. That is because of the additional gain applied to the spectrum waterfall in the S meter. The internal noise seems to rise, while atmospheric noise, which is just another signal, does not change. Most non-SDRs do not make this compensation. Continuing down the right side is a large area with extensive settings for all four virtual receivers, which may be activated in this display. The individual controls for each receiver are very flexible and comprehensive. The available control is awesome. We'll be talking a lot about that later. Below that are 16 band buttons that you can define and label, making this your own unique radio. In the lower right corner is an information panel displaying time and CPU usage. SW2 usage is very light compared to other comparable SDR software I've seen. To its left is a wide block with mode and filter information as well as the recorder, which can record just audio or an entire spectrum. You can play back that spectrum and tune later as if it were live. The basic controls for the recorder are just to the right of the power button. We'll be talking about the recorder later in part three. Just above are four buttons. Set opens the setup window containing many advanced options. Mem opens the memory window. Log opens the built-in logging program. And File allows you to open audio or spectrum files for playback. The large block in the center, the combination spectrum and waterfall display, sometimes called a pan adapter, is an effective and powerful tool. The spectrum shows you what's happening now, and the waterfall shows you what has happened. With a little experience, you can easily identify different signals like sideband, CW, RIDI, AM, and even slow scan TV or PSK31. Just below the spectrum is information about its present state span, FFT resolution, horizontal scale, band, and display averaging. Below that are three drag bars. Along the left side of the spectrum display is a DBM scale. DBM refers to decibels above or below one milliwatt. S9 is minus 73 DBM, so each of the numbers has a minus sign in front of it. Each S unit represents a 6 dB change, so as an example, S8 would be minus 79 dBm. To the left of the waterfall is a rainbow. By dragging the top or bottom of the rainbow, you can change the colors of the waterfall. To the right is a vertical drag bar, allowing you to make the spectrum or the waterfall larger. While tuning can be accomplished a number of ways, let's see how it's done using the spectrum waterfall. 
You may click anywhere in the spectrum or waterfall to instantaneously change to that frequency. Below are three drag bars. Dragging the top bar will change the frequency at a slow rate. The middle bar is somewhat faster. And the bottom bar can be used to quickly drag through the entire spectrum. Very nice. And it can all be customized in the setup menu. Right click in the waterfall or spectrum and a menu window appears. Under click options, notch refers to the manual notch filters which have some additional controls in the upper right corner of the main window. Marker 1 and 2 allow frequency and level measurements to be made from the spectrum display. If you activate both, it will calculate differences between them. This feature seems to come from ELAD's 25-year history in the test equipment business. There are some other choices as well, and they're all explained in detail in Section 2.1 of the SW2 manual. We'll talk about them later as well. The default spectrum shows about 155 kilohertz. Other widths are available, but we'll get to that later. Within that spectrum, up to four separate virtual receivers may be activated in the software and are represented by the red, yellow, green, and blue blocks in the upper right-hand corner of the ELAD SW2 main window. The left block, red, although it can be changed along with most colors used in the display, is the default receiver and cannot be removed. Clicking on any of the other blocks activates that receiver, fills the block with its color, puts a colored line under the block, places a color frequency filter indicator in the spectrum waterfall, and changes the color of the frequency readout. A block with only a colored border means that that receiver is inactive. A solid block means that receiver is active, and a line under the block indicates you have control for that block. Clicking an inactive block activates it and switches control to that block. Clicking a block that is already active and does not have control switches control to that block. Clicking a block that is active and has control deactivates that block. The mouse wheel will also tune the controlled receiver. Slip. At the top of the Spectrum Waterfall window is the Tuning Commands panel with the frequency readout in the center. Let's talk a little about the three buttons just to the right of the frequency readout. A white background means that button is on. These affect only the controlled receiver, that is the block that is underlined. Thus, these controls may be set individually for each of the four colored receivers. The left button, arrow CF, moves that color receiver to the center frequency, the same as the radio itself. Remember, the radio always tunes the center frequency. Lock to CF, or lock to center frequency, locks that receiver to the center frequency so that it will remain the same as the radio, whether tuned by the radio knob or by the software. This is the default for a single receiver. Lock ABS locks the controlled receiver to an absolute frequency, except it cannot be forced outside the limits of the spectrum waterfall. Even when locked, you can still drag or use the mouse wheel to change that receiver's frequency when control for that color receiver is selected, as indicated by the color of the frequency readout and the line under the color block. Lock ABS keeps that particular software receiver on frequency as you tune other receivers. The spectrum display will move dragging any lock ABS or lock to absolute frequency receivers along with it. We've seen how to individually tune these four receivers, but how do we determine what we're listening to? While there are separate controls for each receiver for some things, volume, mute, squelch, right-left stereo select, there is only one set of controls for certain other audio functions. These are switched to the receiver being controlled, indicated by the line under one of the colored blocks and the frequency readout color so everything can be individually adjusted for each receiver. 
There is one very important setting in the setup menu that determines how the mute function works for the four receivers. Later in part three, I'll be discussing the various setup menu tabs in detail. But there is one change I wish to make now. Open the setup menu by clicking the set button in the lower left corner of the SW2 window. Select the audio tab along the top of the menu. At the bottom center of the menu is a checkbox marked Mute the VRX Not Selected. If checked, it will mute all receivers except the one selected. I prefer to leave it unchecked, in which case I can select the audio I want to listen to, regardless of which receiver I have selected for control. The audio for these receivers is controlled by the four identical clusters of controls a little below the buttons. Clicking the speaker icon mutes or unmutes that receiver. Volume 1 adjusts the sound going to the speaker, while Volume 2 adjusts the audio level being fed to your favorite digital mode program. Yes, you can have multiple receivers feeding multiple programs simultaneously. The L and R buttons can individually activate the left and right stereo channels for each receiver. You could have one or more receivers on the left channel and others on the right. Muting RX1, for example, only mutes Volume 1, which feeds the speakers. Volume 2 will continue to feed a signal to a digital mode program. The Master Mute button in the upper left corner of the SW2 window mutes everything. In the area around the four colored virtual receiver blocks are a number of controls that make adjustments to whichever one of the four receivers is being controlled. Included are check boxes and adjustment sliders to activate and deactivate the noise blanker, noise reduction, and auto notch. There are also adjustments for two manual notch filters, red and green. The frequency of each may be typed in or determined by clicking. To enable notch filter clicking, right-click in the display, choose Click Options, then Set Notch 1 or Notch 2 Frequency. Using the controls in the upper right corner, you can tune a filter off or on to an absolute frequency, which stays on a particular frequency or rel or relative frequency, which moves with the tune frequency. The BW, or bandwidth, may be adjusted as well. These are not as handy as the automatic notch filters, but they sure work better. If you wish to return to click tuning the frequency, you must again right-click in the display, choose Click Options, and then Set Tune Frequency. Immediately below the colored virtual receiver blocks is a drop-down menu for mode, with many more choices than the standalone radio. There are several choices for CW, which we'll discuss in Part 3. Take note, you can only hear the key or side tone when listening to the radio. So when using the internal keyer, you must listen to the radio, which means the filter settings in the software mean nothing, since you're listening to the radio. The pan adapter display is still very useful, though. Just make sure the display is in the CW mode. Another advantage, receive delay is only about 35 milliseconds in the radio. Using my computer and USB connections, I measured about a 160 millisecond delay listening to the software. This longer delay is only really noticeable in full break-in, though. Other than CW, I normally listen to the computer since so many more options are available. Since there are so many CW options in SW2, we'll discuss that more fully in Part 3. There are also controls for filter bandwidth and AGC settings, including an AGC threshold slider. I described in detail in Part 1, the Duo Standalone video, how to use this control effectively. It can greatly reduce background noise and make listening a real pleasure. Of course, if you're listening to the computer, that is the software, then you need to use this AGC threshold, which can be individually set for each of the four colored receivers. If you're listening to the radio, 
you need to adjust the AGC threshold in the radio. Just to the left is an open space which may contain additional controls needed for some modes such as DRM or ECSS or synchronous AM. Right above the waterfall, just above each active frequency filter indicator, you'll find the letters TX. Click on the one you wish to use for transmit, thus ensuring that is the transmit frequency in mode. Also, you now have a drop-down menu for mode, and if you're in one of the voice modes, a choice of microphone or USB input, or for CW, you can choose key or pad for paddle. The ADV button opens an advanced TX window with many additional options. We'll talk about that in part three. Let's go back to the tuning commands panel with the frequency readout in the center. To the left is the snap button and tuning step indicator. The tuning step may be adjusted using the keyboard left right arrows. Tuning may be accomplished with the up down arrows. Remember the question mark in the upper right hand corner? This is only one of the many very handy keyboard shortcuts hiding behind that question mark. Just to the right of the tuning step indicator is the snap button, which rounds the frequency to the nearest even step, and the lock button, which locks all frequency tuning in the software. This works independently of tuning lock in the radio itself, as described in the first video about standalone operation. Even if the radio is completely locked, you can still tune it with the software. On the right side of the tuning commands panel are plus and minus buttons for zooming the spectrum in and out. When you're zoomed in, two arrows appear to the left and right side of the display, allowing you to pan left or right. As an alternative, you can hold the shift button and drag horizontally in the spectrum display to select an area. Releasing the mouse button zooms to that area. You must release the mouse button before the shift button, though. Once zoomed in, an X appears next to the zoom buttons. Click it and instantly zoom out to full wide. The arrow just below the ELAD logo collapses the controls to the right. To the left of the zoom controls is an IF and an AF button. The IF buttons opens a closer, high-resolution spectrum waterfall view of whichever virtual receiver is being controlled, the one that has the line under the box. An IF view may be open for each of the four virtual receivers. Many controls will be familiar and work the same as in the main window, including the option to shift-drag an area to zoom. There's even a reminder of that at the bottom of the window. In addition, you may view the spectrum before or after the demod filter. You can drag tune in the IF window, but the tune button at the top must be activated. I initially overlooked the many capabilities of the IF view, seeing them as pretty much redundant of the main spectrum waterfall. I found it very useful, though, to have the close-in view around the received frequency in addition to the wider view of the main window. This can be especially valuable when the main view is set to a really wide spectrum, like 3 or 6 MHz. The close-in view is also helpful for fine-tuning a CW frequency. Don't forget about the shift-drag option to zoom in. It has the additional benefit of automatically centering your selected view. If screen real estate becomes a problem, you can simply collapse the main window to the taskbar, leaving more room for multiple IF windows as well as other programs. The resolution of the IF view is excellent. By zooming in to the extreme, you can determine the frequency of a carrier within one hertz. This helps get an accurate WWV calibration to menu 85 on the radio. Measurement markers may be deployed much the same as those made available by right-clicking in the main display. Pressing the Delta Mark button will display the difference between Mark 1 and Mark 2, both frequency and amplitude. An AF or audio spectrum view may be opened 
but is assigned to whichever virtual receiver is selected. Check the block underline in color. A receive equalizer and audio filter are available in this view. We've talked about the various click and drag tuning methods in the main at IF Spectrum Waterfall display. We mentioned the up-down and left-right arrows for tuning and tuning step. But wait, there's more. By either hitting the space bar or double-clicking the frequency readout, you open the advanced tuning window. You can type a frequency or scroll the mouse wheel while hovering over a digit. If the snap is engaged, you will be limited by the step size. That is, you can't change a digit that would set the frequency outside the bounds determined by the tuning step and snap setting. And of course, there's still the tuning knob on the radio. Take note, a large step combined with snap will prevent the radio from making small steps. Just turn off snap to allow smaller steps using the advanced tuning window or the tuning knob. A wide block across the bottom of the main window displays a variety of information. The model and serial number of the attached radio are in the upper left corner of the block, and to the right general information in about the status of the software. If NR or AN or orange, that indicates that noise reduction or automatic notch filter are active. Next, mode and filter width are shown. This refers to the active receiver and can be different for each of the four colored receivers. To the right, LO, or local oscillator, is the center frequency and the frequency to which the radio itself is tuned. Note that if none of the colored software receivers is locked to the center frequency, they could all be tuned to frequencies other than the local oscillator, the frequency to which the radio is tuned. Receive filter widths can be adjusted in a variety of ways. You can use the filter bandwidth control in the upper right hand corner of the main window or the X and Z buttons to increase or decrease the filter widths. In the IF window you simply drag the edges. Very flexible and intuitive. You must use the IF window though. This does not work in the main window. When you choose CW some extra controls appear to the left of the mode menu, allowing you to activate and adjust a digital resonator filter. There's a reverse button as well. There is a third option for operating the duo. Giovanni HB9EIK wrote a program which can be used on your Android tablet or phone to control the duo. There is no direct connection to the duo as the link between the radio and tablet is Bluetooth. The program or app is called Blue Duo. It's free and can be downloaded from the ELAD site. There's an interactive spectrum waterfall display and direct touchscreen controls for many functions, as well as dedicated band buttons and an S meter. It's an easy to use alternative to the full blown software. It augments the controls of the radio, but doesn't have full functionality, so it's not really a remote control you'll still want the knobs and buttons on the radio. Also required is a Bluetooth dongle that plugs into the Duo and uses the common HCO5 Bluetooth module. The baud rate of the module needs to be changed to 115,200 and the name changed to Blue Duo to be recognized by the Android app. This can be accomplished with a Raspberry Pi or a Windows terminal program and a USB to TTL RS-232 converter. The HVO5 can be found for about $8 shipped from the U.S. or about $3 shipped from China if you're willing to wait. I soldered the HCO5 module directly to the DB9 connector included with the Duo, which almost fits inside the modified DB9 hood. A 7-inch Android tablet I bought on sale for $40 finishes out the package. Information on programming the HCO5 can be found on the web at Ham Radio Science. Click Projects at the top and scroll down to Wireless Touchscreen Remote for the ELAD FDM Duo. There's a video there showing the process and help is available on the ELAD Yahoo group. 
There may be other sources, and I may be able to help. Check my QRZ page. While the SW2 software is robust and complicated, sticking with the defaults can get you going pretty quickly. Using Blue Duo on your Android device is really simple, but getting the dongle working takes a little effort. This should give you a good start using your Duo and the SW2 software. Part 3 will address some of the more advanced features, including what amounts to a whole new radio, with four more receivers. We'll talk about the wide variety of customizing options available in the setup window, the FDM Duo standalone control, and the advanced TX windows. We'll explore the very capable player recorder and talk about the extensive features of this remarkable radio. There's much more.